Okay, section 10.4, kinetic energy of rotation. So if you think for a moment about a table saw, like the one shown that's cutting through the wood, it has a ton of kinetic energy. It's moving really, really fast, right? In order to be able to slice through the wood like that. But if we looked at our classic kinetic energy, one half mv squared, the net translational velocity would be zero. The table saw, fortunately, is not moving along and you know sawing anything in its path. It's stuck in place. So we need a different way to describe how it has kinetic energy than our classic one half mv squared. So we're going to find an equivalent here. What we'll do is we'll take the kinetic energy formula for a point particle and we'll sum over all of the particles. So thinking about like our buzz saw, if we imagine that it's broken down into say people like these ice skaters, each of these are some amount of mass that each have their own amount of velocity, right? The skater on the very outside has to go the fastest to stay in a line with the others. The one in the pivot point doesn't have to move at all, velocity zero, and smaller the closer you are to the pivot point. So there's different linear velocities for every point, every skater, or every part of the mass that's rotating, but yet the same angular velocity. Um, just because there's different radii, that causes there to be a different linear velocity. So this is the picture to hold in mind. And so as we apply it, these two first two points are the same. We can then write the velocity instead of v, the linear velocity, we could write in terms of angular velocity, angular velocity times the radius, where the radius is different, but the angular velocity is in fact the same. That means the angular velocity isn't part of the summation, neither is the one half. So we have one half parentheses, the summation of the, all the mass elements times their radius squared, and then the quantity of that times the angular velocity squared. And this quantity in parentheses is what we call the rotational inertia I, which we saw in lab a bit and we've alluded to it like with Newton's second law of rotation. It's also often referred to as the moment of inertia. So either of those works, um, but it's always a capital I. So that's something to pay attention to. And the rotational inertia is a constant for a rigid object and a specified, a given rotational axis. It will always be the same. Now note that axis must always be specified because you will have a different rotational inertia depending on your axis of rotation. So let's get this written out more explicitly. We can write out the rotational inertia I is equal to the sum of the masses times their distances from the axis of rotation squared. So MR squared is a good one to note and you're going to sum it up. So if you just have individual particles you can sum up each of those masses and their distance from the axis of rotation. You can also then uh, rewrite the kinetic energy. Now that we have this I definition officially, we can plug that into our previous equation, rewrite our kinetic energy as one half I omega squared, where again, our angular velocity here is in radians per second. So the radians matter. And this is our rotational kinetic energy. So the energy that goes into something spinning or rotating. So we'll use these equations, specifically this one for I, anytime you have a finite set of rotating particles. So it's not an object, like we aren't here focusing on a tennis racket that's spinning. We're just focused on, hey, we have this mass that's at some distance. It's rotating from the axis of rotation. Now, what is this rotational inertia? We have the quantitative number. What does that mean conceptually? What it's trying to convey is how difficult is it to change the state of rotation, to speed it up, to slow it down, or change the axis of rotation. And so there's an example with a rod, and you can try this out with a pen, recommend it, or a heavier, longer tube if that's easier, right? And what you'll find is that the marker is much easier to rotate along the long axis of rotation through the core of it. Right? That's not very hard, but it's a lot harder to rotate it end over end. Right? This way is harder, and so in fact, even though the markers haven't changed, the mass is the same, the rotational inertia is different between rotating about the long axis or spinning them end over end. 
So that's in effect what we're trying to convey with rotational inertia. And the more you do calculations with it, the more comfortable you're going to feel with it. So let's look at a checkpoint, checkpoint four. The figure shows three small spheres that rotate about a vertical axis. The perpendicular distance between the axis and the center of each sphere is given. Rank the three spheres according to the rotational inertia about that axis greatest first. I want you to think about this, choose an answer, and then let yourself go on in the video. So make sure to go ahead and hit pause. Okay, hopefully you did that. Now let's check it out. So it is C, they are all equal. Why is that? Well, this is a case where we have finite particles that are rotating about the rotation axis. So if we wanna calculate their rotational inertia, oh, let me get off this yellow. If we wanna calculate the rotational inertia I, then because there's just one particle, we don't even need the summation, it'll just be their mass times their distance from the axis of rotation squared. So for the first one, right, then that is a mass of 36 kilograms times a radius of one squared. So it comes out to 36. We could do the same for the second and third cases. The second case is nine kilograms times the two meters squared. And when the two meters is squared, that becomes four meters squared times nine, that's again 36 kilograms uh, times, I should add in my units here. So the units of rotational inertia are going to be kilograms times meters squared. There we go. And it'll be the same thing for the third one. Even though the mass is tiny compared to the first one, because it's three times further away and that distance is squared, it comes out to be exactly the same, right? So this tiny four kilogram mass, when it's at a distance that's three meters away and that distance is squared, the three meters becomes nine meters squared times four is again, 36 kilograms times meters squared. So that's where we have it. And that brings us through the kinetic energy of rotation.